blessing then for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, it is such a joy and blessing for me to come amongst you and to bring God's word to you and to join in uh, with thanksgiving to God for such an occasion. It is good to come together to give thanks to God. God has blessed you. The word of God has gone forth from this place. God's people have been fed. And all of these things are reasons to be thankful to God. I always am amazed, I think, that we have the scriptures. There are so many people in this world do not have them. We have a hymn book full of hymns. And in our lifetime, we don't sing through them. And there are so many nations in this world, so many languages that are not so blessed as we are. We have the word of God preached to us week after week. And from this pulpit, many of you have, have received it, heard it. And how blessed you are then. And how we ought to be thankful to the Lord. Now I want to, my intention to be of an encouragement to you this evening. And to pick up this passage, which is a little bit of an obscure passage. Um, the first five verses of Judges chapter 10 to bring to you and uh, to leave it before you as an encouragement. Here in the book of Judges, we want to consider these lives of certain individuals, uh, these ministers of two of the minor judges, as it were, and to examine the lives of these two men that are mentioned here, Tola and Jair. Yes, the Bible has very little to say about these two men. It has very little to say about their lives, about their deeds. But they all have much to teach us. Even in this, this short passage. <clears throat> Dear friends, there is a danger to think that those who can make any difference. Uh, or those who can serve. And honor God in life and society are those with some credentials and, uh, or honor or education or position or leadership or those who have big names and those who have involved in big things. Just coming in the car, uh, we, we were discussing about this, about big organizations, big affiliations, big churches. Are they really as effective in the spiritual realm, as one would think? Are these recognized people ultimately recognized in the things of God and heaven? The key point, dear friends, in the study of Israel's judges is that God used and God still uses all kinds of people. All kinds of people. Some known some not known. And you might think to yourself, well, who are we? What can we do? Nobody knows us. Praise God, the Lord knows us. He's called his sheep by name, and we have Christ as the head of the church. And dear friends, in our times, the internet and other forms of social media and and all sorts of things that people use these days, I believe it's become, in many ways, a snare to many individuals. And so the, the whole concept of the local church and gathering with God's people is, is, is disregarded. And they think, well, it's, it's, the, it's these big things that is going to be actually effective in this world. Well, we ought to use everything to the best of our abilities for the glory of God. But God has set for us his means. And he uses individuals. And often, as we see it, unknown people. Very little said about them. So let us think about these. And my subject this evening is, or this afternoon is, the unknown men who made a difference for the glory of God. We read of our Lord Jesus Christ. That when he came unto his own, his own received him not. 
Isaiah speaks in Isaiah 53 that he comes forth as a shoot, just as a little plant, unknown, weak. And yet what impact he has made in this world. He just transformed the world through his life and death and resurrection. And now his, his glorious place on the throne of heaven. And his name is the thing that men ought to know, not our name. May our names perish, but the name of Jesus Christ, which is above every name, being magnified and glorified. That's what our aim is. That's the aim of this congregation, to make his name known. And the first thing that I want us to think about, I have to keep my eyes on time. My wife always says, when I preach elsewhere, I preach longer. Um, so please bear with me. Don't think this is always the case. Um, but... Um, I hope whatever is said, it will be applied to your own life. But the first thing is this. From verse 1 we get. Of the ungodly chaos that these two judges inherited. The ungodly chaos they inherited. Look at verse 1. And after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel, Tola and uh, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir, in Mount Ephraim. Now, verse 1, it causes us to remember a man by the name of Abimelech. Now, his, his account, his story is found in Judges chapter 9. Now, Abimelech was an interesting man. Abimelech was the son of um, Gideon by his concubine. You read about this in, in Judges chapter 8 and verse 31. And after the death of Gideon, Abimelech, he determines within himself that he will be the ruler of Israel. He convinces his mother's people, the Shechemites, to support him in his quest to become the king of Israel. He was a wicked man. And this is something for us, my friends, to, to remember. Grace doesn't necessarily run in families. And, and you might find yourself that, that at times discouraged. Parents can become very discouraged. You've sought to do what you can to bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But somehow something happens. They don't turn out the way that you had hoped. And how discouraging that can become. How discouraged Gideon must have been. My friends, what we ought to do is to be faithful. The results are with the Lord. Be faithful to God. That's all that counts. Not the results. But here it was, this man, this wicked Abimelech. That's the legacy that, that those two judges received. And uh, what we find is that the men of Shechem, they confer among themselves and decide to help Abimelech. And they give him 70 pieces of silver. In Judges chapter 9, we read about that in verse 4. And using that money, Abimelech hires a group of um, thugs, we could say, to, to help him achieve his goal. He did wicked things. He, he takes these men to his father's house and he kills the 69 of his 70 half-brothers. The youngest, a boy uh, by the name of Jotham, he is, escapes. And after this, the men of Shechem, they declare Abimelech to be their king. And after his anointing, Abimelech ruled as the king for three years. And in the end, the men of uh, Shechem turned on Abimelech, and there was war between them and the followers of Abimelech. And in the midst of an attack upon the walls of Thebes, uh, Abimelech got too close to the wall. And you know that account, uh, that, that there was this woman. She must have been a very strong woman who threw a piece of millstone. Have you ever lifted a millstone? Uh, well, it is a very heavy thing. Uh, and uh, she, she lifts it up, and she throws it on the top of his head. And, um, and Abimelech, knowing that he was dying, Abimelech commanded one of his men to kill him with a sword so that it won't be said that Abimelech had been killed by a woman. Well, by the time um, Abimelech is dead, the nation of Israel is left in tatters from a vicious civil war 
there is military upheaval, and it's um, is is and and that military upheaval isn't the only problem the nation faced. The Bible tells us that as soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned turned their backs on God and g- gave their worship to the Canaanite fertility god Baal. That's what we read in chapter eight. And verses 34 and 33 and 34. And as a result, all of these problems, the national problems of Israel, happen. And Israel is in a mess. We can think about this in, in the state of this country. We can think about it in the state of the church in general. What a mess we are in. And we need a savior. And the savior is not in men, the savior is God Himself. He is that great judge. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that we need. And uh, so think on this, dear friends. And think on this uh, as we we have considered this, of a couple of principles here. First of all, God always has a remnant. God always has a remnant. The numbers may be few. But they're a remnant of God. And we thank God for it. That God has not left himself without a witness. But there's always a witness. In different parts of the world. In Israel, things were bad. The nation is at war with itself. And the majority of the people are worshipping idols. And in the midst of all of that, God has has a, a faithful remnant. That fact has not changed. When Elijah entered the valley of depression that he was in, he came to believe that he was the only person in the country that was, that was living for God and was serving God and trusted in Jehovah. And he soon found out that, uh, that had, um, <clears throat> God had a remnant and the Lord rebuked him. Elijah is told that uh, there still is 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. God still has a remnant. You are a remnant of God. If you follow the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. God has a remnant throughout this land. And that gives us great hope. And encouragement. God is not finished with us yet. Uh, we might think. Oh the glory is departing. But it hasn't departed yet. And we thank God for that. So every year that passes. And the gospel is preached from this pulpit. It gives us great hope. The light continues shining. It, it might, you might think, oh, it's flickering. But still is there. And that's a miracle of God. That's the work of God. We don't despise the days of the small things. Don't do that. We complain a lot. We moan a lot. We, uh, we are worried about the future. Let us be concerned about now. Here and now. Be faithful to God now. The Lord is the God of the future. Christ is the head of his church. God always has a remnant. And and in this day of increasing uh, immorality and rampant wickedness, God still has a faithful people who love him, who serve him, who live for him. There are still people who have a prayer closet. There are still people who believe the word of God, that the word of God is the word of God. There are still people who love the the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church. There are still people who will tell this lost world about a Savior who would save sinners. There are still people who are singing God's praises, who want this kind of worship in reverence before God. While this remnant might not be in the majority They are still here. And that is for the glory of God. You ought to think on that. Another principle that we learn from this is that serving God is not always easy, but it is always right. It's not always easy, but it is always right. It must have been very difficult for Tola and Jair as they dealt with the problems that were left behind by Abimelech. And as they uh, dealt with the idolatry of the nation. So, so you, you read just that v- one verse, but 
all of these things you have to think about what had happened before what had taken place before and all the mess that was left behind it was not an easy day in the ministry of Tola and Jair but they ministered anyway they served the Lord anyway with all of these issues with all of these problems it wasn't as they had wished and, and this is a great encouragement to me I have to say I look at the state of our own local church and I, I think of myself, all, all, all of these different issues, and, and elders and pastors and church officers, we, we can see all kinds of issues, and that can be very discouraging. And, and there are times that you think, I, I, I ought to give up. I can't, I can't do anything. I can't help the people in some things. Or, or you feel yourself so weak and helpless. My friends, it is better to continue on serving the Lord in spite of all of these other things. The Lord is, is, is worthy of our service. <clears throat> so we could learn a lot from their example. It's not always easy to walk in the old paths when everyone around us is looking for something new. But it is right. It is not always easy to live <clears throat> for the Lord when others around us are living for the world and the flesh and the devil. But it is right. It isn't uh, always easy to do the right things when others around us are, are <clears throat> acting in bad ways. But it is always right. And when you see churches that name the name of Jesus Christ uh, are, are going and, and falling and compromising. It is not easy to hear these things. And, and, and there are temptations all around us for us to submit, to, for us to begin to think, well, maybe if we do this, if we do that, then maybe we, we can have success. But what success? Do we want the success with the world? No, we don't want the success with the world. We want the smile of the Lord. That's what we want. And if we have the smile of Christ, that's all is enough. Is enough. It doesn't matter where two or three are gathered together in his name. If we have his, his smile, that's enough for us. He will sustain us. To so be encouraged, dear friends, from this Tola and Jair. I don't know if you passed through these verses quickly before and you thought, well, who are these people? I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon on it. But you think these people served in the worst of times and nothing is said about them. We don't know all the details. But what we know, they judged Israel faithfully. They were the saviors of Israel faithfully for those years. Our duty is not to look to others, but our eyes should be fixed upon Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And the way you look to him is looking through the, the glasses of his scripture, the word of God, which is the word of Christ. And you look to the one who ran his, his course. He ran his own race and will enable us to run ours also. We read in Hebrews 12 and verses 1 through to 3, the apostle says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So we have all of these witnesses. We have what a testimony. We have what a heritage we have, both from the scriptures and from the history of the church. And from the history of this nation too. We have this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. This is the key. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne Wringing his hands, worried? No, he doesn't say that. He sat down. He's not worried. He's standing and saying, what are we going to do? What's the church going to do? Will they be in, in 10 years' time? No, that's not what he's doing. He sat down. His work is finished. It's, it's as if it's all done. The church is victorious. You know, I always think about this. Because we are living in a day that that people think so low of the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we keep losing people. 
My friends, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't lose anyone. He, is, he will not lose his elect. He will, he will keep his own. For whom Jesus Christ died, he will keep. Do you know who is, who is losing members? It's Satan who is losing members. His kingdom is losing members. There are sinners who are being snatched as brands from the burning. From his kingdom. And so he rages and he raves and he's, he's angry. And he wants to destroy the church, but he can't. It must be frustrating. The most frustrated person in this world is the devil. Because he's already lost. And he can't win. So be encouraged, dear friends. And here this is what the apostle says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then it says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And then it says, Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. If you are faint and wearied in your minds, could it be that you have been looking to men? Look into people, look into individuals, look into your circumstances, and you become discouraged. I would be. And at times I am. And I have to think to myself, what am I doing? Where am I looking? To whom am I looking? And then it is that I look to the Savior, and then with his strength, then I can say, I can do all things through Christ, who strengtheneth me. The Lord said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Our world, dear friends, and this Christ-rejecting country, it has become so heathen. It's not a Christian country at all anymore. There's vestiges. There is, there's some structures in some places you, you see and hear. Some people do things, and they don't even know why they are doing it. But it's because of the Christian heritage. But this country is in a mess, spiritually. And no one would argue with that. We, and we can lay the blame... For that, anywhere we like, we can blame the parliament. We can br blame the modern and contemporary churches. And we can blame one another too. And that's what the devil would want. But, dear friends, at the end of the day, where does the blame lie? Where did the blame lie with Israel? Was it with these uh, heathen Amalekites and other tribes around them? No, it was with themselves. And the Lord said it. And, and the Lord says, you have forsaken me. He says in verse 13, ye have, yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Have we done that? What a challenge that is. What should we do? We should give thanks to God for his mercies and we should repent of our sins. That's the best course of action. Uh, a humble attitude for God's people. And to include ourselves like Daniel in his own prayers, that we have sinned against God. And this is why this has happened to us. So it is time for the remnant of the Lord to, to humble themselves and, and also to stand up as, as we are singing and to fight a good fight of faith for the things that still remain. The apostle says this in Romans 13 and verse 11. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far as spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Not in chambering, chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So it is, it is important for us to look to the Lord 
and to fight where we can. And to fight mainly upon our knees in prayer. Because this battle is of the Lord. The things that we see around us, it is, it is of the Lord. The Lord must work. So here is this one thing we learn about what they inherited. It wasn't good. But secondly, we want to think about the ministry that they performed. The ministry that they performed. These two, Tola and Jair, may not have led a, any great military campaigns. They might not have commanded great armies. They may not have left a legacy of great spiritual achievements. But what they did accomplish deserves consideration. What they did still ch uh, challenges us as well today. These men helped something. What did they help? What can you see in these verses? One thing you don't see is wars. Why, one thing you don't see is contention in the land. They kept the peace of the land. And that's a great thing. That's a great thing. That's the legacy. They maintained peace for what? For how many years? For nearly 50 years in a nation split apart by war. Split apart by rebellion and pagan worship. And that in itself is no small achievement, dear friends. When there were no attacks from the outside, they helped prevent the nation from being ripped apart from the inside. Uh, theirs was a ministry of peace in a time of turmoil. A, a ministry of building up. And that's important for us to, to re remember. There is nothing said of all of the, the things that they did. But they kept the nation, during that time to be faithful. These men also helped to preserve the heritage of their nation. They preserved the heritage of the nation. All of these things are implied here. They kept the faith. They encouraged others to keep the faith. They removed idolatry from the land. And so we can read these verses very quickly and because there isn't said much about them we, we just pass over them and not think through well actually these were faithful men we are excited when we read of Gideon and others but, but actually Gideon was quite a weak man in, in so many ways and the Lord had to deal with him so much and yet none of that is said about Tola and Jair they seem to be mature godly men for their times that the Lord had risen They ministered to the faithful remnant in Israel in a time when that fading remnant needed consistent leadership. And my friends, you might think of the fading remnant in, in England. Let us be consistent. Let us be an encouragement to one another. Let us be faithful. Tola and Jair did... <clears throat> in their day, exactly what we are supposed to be doing in our day. They acted like salt. They acted like salt. Our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about salt, that his people are to be the salt of the earth. We read of this in Matthew 5 and verse 13. And as, as you know, what does salt do? Salt does many things. Salt purifies. Salt adds flavor. Salt uh, brings out the, the flavor of what, you, uh, what may have been a very bland food. It helps to preserve meat and such things. I want us to think about this. The, that these, we think about Jair and Tola as men who were those who were like the salt of the earth for that uh, nearly 50 years of their time as judges. In the Bible times, Salt was more valuable, we are told, than money. The ancient Romans used to give a soldier his pay in salt rather than in money. And the word salary, it comes to us from the Roman word salarium, which speaks of a soldier being paid in salt. We use the term, this man is not worth his salt. 
That comes from this practice. And when the Lord Jesus Christ calls his people the salt of the earth, he uses it as a metaphor that teaches about the influence of his people in the world today. And, and these two judges, we can think of them as being salts. Let's think about this. We are to have a pres preserving influence in this world. Salt wards off rot and decay. It, it is rubbed into the meat to, to preserve it. So it is in, in our nation today. And I'm convinced that it is the presence of a people like you who gather together to hear the word of God and to pray. That is something that acts like salt. Why is England is not, has not reached anarchy? Why are we not like so many other nations still? Because could it be that people have been praying? Could it be God is still is answering our prayers? So, so let us continue in this way. I believe that the prayers of the Lord's people have it's done more to preserve this nation than the parliament and all these other things that, that people try to do to preserve our, our values and so on. And it's the same thing that we ought to do today. Righteousness exalteth a nation. But how can people be made righteous? It's by the grace of God. And God answers prayer when we intercede for others, for their salvation, and for them to be kept. Another thing about salt is penetrating. It's penetrating influence. Salt would penetrate and in infiltrate whatever it touches. It's an aggressive salt, uh, substance. And dear friends, the early church was an ag ag aggressive substance, we could say. We read in Acts 8 and verses 1 and 4, And Saul was consenting unto his death. That was to Stephen's death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So here are these people scattered. Why? Because they're being persecuted. Therefore they, it says in verse 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. That's what they did. That's, that's the influence. That's the salty influence. And what happened? Then we read in Acts 17 and verse 6, and when they found them not, the Jew, the, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. So the, the influence has, has gone throughout the known world. They might have been exaggerating here. But, my friends, the known world was, was influenced. The Roman Empire was influenced by this gospel that these, these foolish men, these uneducated men, we're preaching. Dear friends, you may, you have been called by the Lord to be an active force in the world around us. It doesn't matter about numbers. But every life that the Lord saves ought to be used as, as this kind of an influence. And the, and the, and the church of Jesus Christ is, is like a force against the gates of hell. That's what it is. We are not on a retreat. We are, we are going forward. So we have these anniversary services. Marking another year. Moving forward. Marching forward. By the grace of God. Not depending on our own strength. We thank the Lord for his mercy and his goodness. We could talk about the purifying influence of the salt. We could think about as well the, the pleasing influence of the salt. I always think of this. Salt brings the best out of the food. My wife doesn't think of it, but uh, I believe it is. The Lord says salt is good. And, uh, and so I put plenty of salt on my food. I'm sure the doctors will not be happy with that either. But um, salt brings out the best. Salt Blends and adds flavor to the food. 
And in fact, some food are, are not eaten because they have no taste unless salt is added. So the, to the Christian, cr the Christian should flavor the world around him. As salt, we are to so live our lives that we are bringing out the best of things concerning the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To, uh, to point sinners to him. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And, and to be an encourager like Apollos. And to help where we can. And to, and to be known that this person is approachable. I can go and share all of my heart's concerns with this person. Are you that kind of a person? Are, are you that kind of an influence that you can bring the best out of people too? Some people, I would have difficulty, I have to say. Some people, uh, when, when they call me, I'm always fearful. Uh, but then there are other people, when they call me, I mean, I'm glad for it. I'm better for it. Be that kind of a person. So when you are poured upon someone's life, you bring the best out of them too. Here was where these two people, when we think about it, they must have been able to influence under God and by God's grace, influence the nation for all of those years to have peace. It wasn't that they were compromising Tola and Jair. They didn't compromise. But they must have been very wise men to be able to bring the best out of people, to, to bring, to unite the nation together. And so there is a lot of wisdom here in this passage. If we only, one day we will see them by the grace of God and we'll be able to talk to them. But what did they do? How did they manage? Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, the apostle says, that whether I come to and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We could also think about the poisoning influence of salt. Salt can kill you if you have too much of it. Uh, we, can, we can pour salt on certain things like slugs and it can kill. We can pour salt on a lawn and it can kill. So it's too much salt, we are told, is not good for you. But my friends, the, the, the saltiness of Christian, it means that, <clears throat> that when the Lord Jesus Christ enters into a life, the life is changed. Things happen in that life that dies. The swearing, the fighting, the hating, the killing, the, the drugging, the all kinds of wickedness that takes place. It, it dies and it continues to in the life of that child of God. Let us be of that influence on, on the world around us there as well. And something else we think about our promoting influence, the salt's promoting in influence. Salt creates a thirst of water in those who are exposed to it. And as salt, the Christian has the wonderful opportunity to pr promote a thirst for Christ in the world in the sense of that the way we live. I've talked to certain individuals and I asked them, what did begin this process of you looking to the Lord? And they said the influence of these Christians. I thought, I, I, what is it that is motivating them? What is it that is moving them? What is it that, is, that has changed them from what they used to be? And I knew what they were, what kind of a people they were. And, and now they're different. They want something different. And God began to use that kind of a thing in the life of others to, as I've said, uh, promoting his gospel to others. Are you living the way you should live? So much <clears throat> could be said about these things, dear friends, but I want to say a little about the message that they preached. The message that they preached. Tola and Jerry, they, <clears throat> for a total of 45 years, they judged Israel. As I said, they didn't lead armies. They, 
didn't build cities, they uh, didn't write books. What they did was for more, far more important. These men stood for God in an evil day. Their lives, though little is recorded about them, still preach to us today, still must speak to us today. Don't bypass these places or, or read quickly and don't think about. But study these lives of unknown people because it will be encouraging to you. You're living in a, in a world that, that the world bypasses us, ignores the places of worship, doesn't think we should, we should go, we should worship God, ignores Christians, ignores our values, promotes the very opposite, and wants us to uphold those things too, the evils that they hold to. But my dear friends, let, let us be encouraged by what we are reading here. When nations, dear friends, William Cooper says, when nations perish in their sins, tis the, in the church the leprosy begins. The priest whose office is with zeal sincere to watch the fountain and preserve it clear, carelessly nods and sleeps upon the brink while others poison what the flock must drink or or. Waking at the call of lust alone, infuses lies and errors of his own. His unsuspecting sheep believe it pure, and tainted by the very means of cure, catch from each other a contagious spot, the foul forerunner of a general rot. And the, and the account goes. How perceptive Cooper was as he penned those words. And what we are reading in this passage is, is what had happened before. What a sad state the nation had, had come to. And yet, these two men achieved great things for God. We could talk about their names that are instructive. Tola means crimson worm, red worm. From that, they used to be able to, to crush the worm and uh, they would, uh, br uh, the, the blood of the worm was, was used to, uh, to dye the wool and so on. And we think about the fact that how, how even his name speaks something of, the, of our Savior. He's, he's called the worm in Psalm 22. And he was crushed. And through his blood, goodness flows forth. Righteousness flows forth for our souls. Salvation, and forgiveness of sins flows forth for our souls. And may by the grace of God, such things flow out of us too, that we might, uh, rivers of living waters flow out of you and me in, this, in the coming years, in the next few months, in the next 12 months, that this place would be a place that, that would continue to shine further for the Lord. Jair, it means enlightener. And our Savior is the light of the world. He is the son of righteousness. And how we ought to be encouraged by that. It's only through the Savior, this light of the world that is preached and lived out, his principles, his, his teachings that are lived out, and as we follow him in our day-to-day -day life, that you and I can be of an influence for good in this world. Dear friends, what can we say then? So much can be, has been said about the influence of these judges. They continue to be of in interest to God's people. You can read commentaries, you can read studies on their lives, but dear friends, be encouraged you and I are not to make a name for ourselves. We are not to be after such things in our life. What we should be after is that as long as the Lord gives you strength, be a good influence in your prayer. Be a good influence in the way you are with one another. Uphold the things that the Lord Jesus Christ has called us to. Remember that of his promises to your soul. 
that he says that he will keep you. So what should we do? As soon as worry comes into our souls and we begin to think, I, I need to say this, I need to complain about this matter. Before we say those things, we, we can say, but the Lord is good. The Lord has kept me. Oh, this, this dear beloved friend has died. This dear beloved family has died. My, my own body is weakening and I, I feel so weak. But it's still the Lord is good. I can give him thanks. He's kept me by his own power. He's blessed me. Oh, that I would be a better man, a better woman for his glory. Let us be encouraged by that. Let us seek to find ways to, to promote the things of God in our surroundings, in our neighborhood, in, in the church. Let us not be given to compromise and think, well, we need to change this and change that. Go back to the old paths. Uphold the, the truth of the word of God and, and not be worried about making a name, as I said. Why is that? Because ultimately it is not about numbers. It's not about uh, the great things we have done. But it's about the great things he has done through his son, the Lord Jesus. That's what we are about. Not our works, but his finished work that we are about. And dear friends, our work will perish. Our names will perish one day. But the name of Jesus and his finished work for his people will remain. And it is through that through Christ, that and, and whatever, if we are preaching Christ and upholding Christ in our lives, then the good shepherd calls his own sheep through all of that. Maybe, maybe be the mouthpieces of Christ, the good shepherd, to this dying world, and then by God's grace, we might see those sheep coming to him too. Well, dear friends, my intention had been to encourage you much more could be said, and I have more notes to say, but I see the time, so I ought to stop. But may the Lord bless you. Uh, it's, it's a great encouragement for me to be amongst you and be assured of my prayers for you. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the truth of Thy Word. We, so, we know so little of it, but we bless Thee that as we study the scriptures, the Holy Spirit opens these things to us. And we ask that thou wouldst continue to lead us. Lead this congregation, O Lord. Bless every minister of the gospel, every man who comes to preach the word of God here. Lord, fill them by the power of thy Holy Spirit. Strengthen them and give them wisdom to rightly divide thy word. We pray that uh, thou wouldst Cause this light to continue to shine. That this candlestick might be given that oil from heaven. And that it may not be removed. But it would continue on in this part of Evington and uh, Leicester. O Lord our God. Arise and scatter thy enemies. Because thy enemies have taken over it seems this land. With false religion. False ideas. Secularism and atheism and false even Christianity that is all around us. Lord, come and uh, destroy the works of the devil in this land. And Lord, we pray that thou wouldst even raise up men of God called by thee to be ministers of the gospel in this land. We, we pray for more of them. We ask that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest field. And Lord, we ask that in our short life, we might be found faithful. That whatever our lot may be, and however thou hast led us, we might be found full of gratefulness to our God and King. Thou art most gracious, full of compassion. Uh, thou art uh, the one who has forgiven us of our sins and made us right with thyself. Thou hast brought us into thy family, and by the Spirit's help, we can cry out, Abba, Father. Lord, go on, we pray before us, and help us to go forward in the strength of thyself. And we pray that if it is thy will, we may return again in a year's time, looking back at what the Lord has done for us. Lord, keep us under the shadow of thy wing, we pray. 
and we shall give thee all the glory and all the praise through our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen.